Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Earth Save Canada's virtual speaker series. I'm Jen from Earth Save Canada, and today we are very fortunate to be joined by Nicholas Carter, who is uh, currently in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Thank you for being here, Nicholas. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, today, uh, Nicholas will be talking about the ecological impacts and solutions with food systems. Um, Nicholas is an ecologist and the co-founder of plantbaseddata.org, a library of peer-reviewed articles on the environmental, health, economic, and zoonotic disease evidence related to the shift to plant-based diets. His research has focused on greenhouse gas emissions attributed to animal agriculture. He recently prepared a scientific report on the impacts of agriculture in Canada. He also leads a climate data hub that's part of the Canadian Centre for Climate Services. As an environmental and climate analyst, Nicholas brings expertise in the environmental and economic impacts of agriculture, climate, zoonotic diseases, and regenerative plant-based farming systems. Now, before I turn it over to our speaker, just a couple of notes about today's program. Uh, Nicholas will be speaking for approximately 45 minutes, uh, and that should give us some time, about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, we do encourage you to post uh, questions within the comment section on Facebook or on YouTube. And anybody who posts a comment or question during the program will be entered to win a $25 gift card from vegansupply.ca. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Nicholas. Okay, hey, thanks so much. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, thanks again for inviting me. And um, yeah, I appreciate uh, all the work you're doing at EarthSave. And um, also, yeah, I appreciate all the uh, previous guests that have been on this uh, speaker series. So I want to first start off with uh, looking at the public perception of what actions will reduce, specifically in this case, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, this poll that was done had a base of over 23,000 adults across 31 different countries. Uh, ages range from 16 to 74. And what they did is that this study systematically reviewed almost 7,000 Peer review studies to kind of rank the 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 true spot, and uh, it was cited in the recent uh, IPCC reports. And what they concluded was that the choice to adopt a vegan diet was the most underestimated environmental behavior relative to how beneficial it actually is, specifically in reducing greenhouse gases. So this underestimation of this urgent shift goes far beyond greenhouse gases, of course and into about every other planetary boundary. But uh, I just wanted to outline that as the main problem for kind of why I did this presentation and a lot of why I do the work that I do. So quick agenda for today. I'm gonna also be looking at some of the perceptions around the protection of land and ocean versus the reality. Uh, I'm gonna talk a lot about land use because I think that's a very key environmental issue and opportunity. Uh, also look at kind of the overall picture of how animal agriculture is um, one of the dominant areas to focus on within food systems. Uh, also want to touch on the extinction crisis and biodiversity loss. How to kind of spot greenhouse um, uh, gas greenwashing and other environmental issue greenwashing. And all, overall the corporate influence of environmental science. And then I'm going to spend some time on solutions in terms of specifically stock-free organic farming, uh, rewilding, and a number of key food tech innovations. And uh, then some overall general comments about the scientific consensus when it comes to food. So yeah, just quickly about me. Um, Plantbaseddata.org is a, a big part of what I'm doing in terms of this work. And uh, as Jen mentioned, we are compiling as best as possible the peer review articles and creating summaries of those as it relates to the environment, health, economic, and zoonotic disease uh, evidence uh, 
in the direction of pointing towards a plant-based diet. And uh, the reason why I'm pointing that again is because every stat and statement that I, I make in this presentation is cited right on the slide and uh, in more detail at the end. And, and I did a tally. It's about over 50 peer-reviewed papers, which um, uh, are described in graphs and statements. And anyone can access these full text copies to, to dig in further and, and do their research on the peer review evidence at um, plant-based data. And um, yeah, so I, there's a number of other things that I have on the go, but uh, the last thing I wanted to mention here was just that I don't have any conflicts of interest for this presentation. I'm an independent researcher. A lot of my work is in the wider climate space as well, uh, leading kind of climate adaptation work with um, one of the Canadian Center for Climate Service uh, data centers. And uh, as well as plant-based data, we don't have any conflicts of interest or financial ties. So we can look at this as unbiased as possible. So many people dramatically overestimate the amount of land and um, ocean and really the natural world that's currently protected. A report by the uh, Center for Climate Change Communications showed that respondents believed roughly 35% of the world's sea is protected, when in reality, just 7% is. And it's a similar story for, for land. Assumptions about how much uh, conserved land vary per country, ranging from Australia, where people thought about 26% of land is protected for nature, to India, where people thought as much as 45% is. In reality, only 15% is. And uh, a note to kind of consider with this too, of that 7% of the ocean and 15% of land, they're not full protection either. A lot of that 7% of the ocean that's protected as kind of marine protected areas, they're not necessarily uh, no catch zones. So there is still uh, some fishing that's going on in these areas. So um, as we look at the COP15 Biodiversity Summit that just uh, finished in Montreal this past December, the overall kind of goal in the nations um, agreed to protect 30% of land and sea by 2030. And this needs to be real protection, of course. Uh, no extraction, let nature be. You can do some a bit more active rewilding in that space, but we need some real protection there. And ultimately, I think the research actually shows we should be higher than that, more like 50%, maybe by 2050. But even at that 30% goal, how do we achieve this? So many of you might have seen a diagram like this before. Uh, and I think it's really important to visualize and interpret exactly uh, how we're going to get there. So any plan to significantly protect land or sea, it's really insignificant unless we address a huge footprint of animal agriculture. The production of animal-based food instead of plant-based food, it's become a major reason for land expansion into nature. So just in the last few decades, the scale of the industry has increased significantly. We're talking 80 billion land animals and really trillions, not really something you can count, uh, sea creatures that are killed yearly for our food system. And in terms of animal agriculture specific footprint, it's about 37 to 45% of all habitable land. So habitable being, you know, not glaciers, not barren land, and of course not ocean, but that's a significant amount, of course. And it's not like this returns back efficient amount of food either. It only returns about 18% of global food calories. And if you look specifically at beef, the, um, the global level of uh, beef uses over 60% of the world's agricultural land, but accounts for less than 2% of global calories and 5% of global protein consumed. So of course, compare that to plant proteins, such as beans, peas, and lentils. And uh, beef requires six times more water, at least 20 times more land. And it typically emits 20 times more greenhouse gases per gram of edible protein. And those are very conservative figures. So flipping this issue around, what opportunities lie ahead with land use? So first conceptualize that this amount of land being used, it's about 3 billion hectares of land dedicated to raising uh, animals. Most of it is for grazing, uh, a big part as well as growing feed crops to, to feed confined animals. And that takes up about the size of the continent of Africa, um, spread out, of course, across the world. And this research and some of the past one on the last slide is based on an analysis, um, a meta-analysis out of Oxford University in 2018. 
from uh, um, scientists uh, uh, Joseph Poor and Thomas Nemechek. And they looked at 570 different studies, almost 40,000 farms, 119 different countries, and really about 90% of the types of foods consumed. And um, yeah, their conclusion was a, a shift to, to plant-based diets, one of the best things we can do in terms of the food system and the overall environmental um, action space uh, as a whole. So this is urgent because if nothing is done, it's been shown that extending the current diet in kind of wealthy westernized countries <clears throat> to the global population, to say countries that are becoming, you know, a bit richer, um, developed, if you want to call it that, uh, you would need to support uh, a significant amount more land for animal agriculture if you if you adopt those diets um, as as countries get richer. And this has been studied. It showed that you need an additional 35 million kilometers square to support livestock production. <clears throat> and that's an area equal to the combined area of the continent of Africa and Australia, in addition to what we already use. So we have choices here. We have choices in terms of uh, where we want to go. And ultimately, we don't have the space without significant displacement um, to uh, to continue this diet. Uh, so this is why land use, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit more in detail, is is definitely one of the most important environmental metrics to to understand. And the main reason why I have this slide on there is because <clears throat> often you see national greenhouse gas estimates for agriculture being very low. And then it's an easy way for people to say, well, okay, it's not a big deal. It's just a small amount of greenhouse gases. And I'm going to get into that specifically. But this diagram shows that how we look at land and what we instead could use land for is actually equivalent to a lot of the equivalent fossil fuel emissions. So if you look at the, the shift to a vegan diet in this case on, the, on the, the left side of this diagram, compare that to the equivalent of about... 16 years of fossil fuel emissions by 2050, if we were to rewild all the, the land used for animal agriculture. So, you know, that's a bit ideal. Maybe more likely it's more something like the Eat Lancet diet, which is like a 80 to 90% um, plant-based diet. And you're still getting significant um, uh, environmental benefit by doing that. And uh, of course, a lot of these countries have had significant deforestation over time, like the US, even Canada, uh, elsewhere, uh, especially in Europe as well. So the loss of forest and natural vegetation dating back to the agricultural revolution has released an extreme amount of CO2. It's equivalent to about 1400 billion tons or 40 years worth of the current fossil fuel emissions. So how we use land is a very important thing. Now, this gets into a lot of the kind of uh, original thesis work that I that I dove into. I dove into the question of, okay, how much direct greenhouse gases come from animal agriculture? And there's a huge vary, variance in terms of what that is. But the, the most cited <clears throat> continue to be the kind of uh, the media link that you'll have in a number of new op-eds that get posted in the New York Times and the Guardian elsewhere is that livestock represents a 14.5% share of total human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. And this is from the FAO in 2013. And uh, their recommendations after providing that, like there were some good things in this report, but the recommendations were uh, to increase intensification, uh, factory farms, uh, technological advancements, and further research into livestock raising. So... That's not surprising from this group because, I mean, they've had direct influence in the accounting, in the overall process from some of the biggest meat, uh, the Meat Secretariat, uh, Dairy Federation, Poultry Council. This is all listed directly on their site. So very much they're an extension of industry and they're not independent environmental, um, it's not an independent environmental analysis. And that was clear based on the data as I was just digging in myself and uh, and consulting with others on the topic too. I mean, they're using statistics from 1964, 1982, 1993, undercounting um, uh, farmed animal numbers. And um, yeah, a number of errors that were very clear. So that should be considered an absolute minimum in terms of the global direct 
uh, greenhouse gases. So to better understand kind of the range in figures, you can see based on this, the text is a bit small in this, but you could you could take a look at this in more detail. Um, I posted on my Instagram and Twitter, but also uh, uh, Martin Mueller, he's the, uh, the link's at the very bottom. He did a great job putting all this together. And um, uh, yeah, you can see 14.5% all the way up to 87%. And really, I think to first start, like, the reality is focusing on percentage percentages as a way of kind of saying a certain industry is more important than other to address. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Like we also need to significantly address the greenhouse gas footprints from fossil fuels. This is not an either or scenario. But um, you know what the FAO has done in time in terms of gaming the numbers is uh, uh, it's definitely wrong. And um, there's been some of that happening on the other side too in terms of uh, showing that there's an extreme amount and really taking a lot of uh, uh, overestimations in terms of how much we can draw down realistically into uh, new ecosystems. So for my study on the topic, I think the most reliable figure is the 2018 Oxford University uh, study, which said that um, it concluded about 28% of greenhouse gases can be mitigated in a fully plant-based diet scenario. And really what can be safely said too is that uh, we will not hit our climate goals. We will not achieve the Paris Agreement if we don't significantly shift to plant-based diets. That's uh, There's countless studies that are pointing in that direction. And uh, just uh, or late in 2021, there was a study from CREPA uh, and others. And um, they showed that as a whole, the entire food system, uh, not including the opportunity to draw down carbon, not including carbon sequestration through land use, but the entire food system represents 25 to 42% of all global greenhouse gases. So again, we're starting to get some more research saying, okay, this is the real picture in terms of climate change and, and the impact from, from animal agriculture. So methane is a key topic in this discussion. And uh, certainly over the last couple of years, this has been a lot made a lot more clear in, in a number of different reports. The uh, United Nations Methane Assessment Report said cutting methane is the fastest and most effective way to slow global warming. 32% uh, to up to 40% of all human-caused methane comes directly from animal agriculture. Most of that is enteric fermentation from uh, ruminants, mostly cattle, but also there's a significant amount as well from uh, manure. Think of all those major uh, manure lagoons, right? So. When measuring other potent greenhouse gases like methane or even nitrous oxide, uh, the general method has been to try to measure it relative to the impacts of CO2. And this has been done by mostly creating a CO2 equivalent figure uh, over a hundred year timeline. And as shown on the left, if I could just kind of describe that, uh, that uh, a little bit, that's from the uh, IPCC AR6 report uh, from uh, 2021 and 2022. And um, the blue is cooling and uh, the red is warming. And if you consider that a lot of sulfur dioxide accompanies uh, CO2 from energy, like fossil fuel, then looking at methane's impact on warming, about 0.5 of the 1.1 or 1.2 degrees of, of warming that we've had since pre-industrial times came ex directly from methane. So other estimates would put methane at about 30%, but that wouldn't factor in, you know, the cooling effect. Um, and I'm not insinuating sulfur dioxide is good. It's a major air pollutant as well. So we need to certainly phase that out. But, uh, but that uh, IPCC diagram really did show that methane is neglected uh, in terms of the impacts it's had to date. And looking at the next 20 years, uh, earth scientists, earth system scientists and methane expert, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert uh, Hallworth from uh, Cornell University, he looked at this in terms of the next 10 or 20 years of uh, estimated CO2 and CH4 emissions. And considering the impacts of, of methane, the next uh, 10 to 20 years essentially will equal in terms of warming impacts from methane and CO2. So ultimately, we reduce methane uh, ASAP, we're going to see atmospheric results quickly. Uh, 
uh, where if we reduce all CO2 uh, right now, which we do need to address ASAP, we're not going to see atmospheric effects for 100 years because that's about how long it will last in the atmosphere. So the reason why it's so urgent to address this now is because if we don't, there's some, some really critical climate thresholds that we may uh, pass in the next few decades that will um, really amplify the issues of climate change. And just the last thing I'll mention on this uh, slide there related to cattle. Cattle, of course, is a cows are a big part of this whole story. And um, looking at the the CO2 equivalent, uh, including you know methane within that equivalency, if cattle were to form their own country, they would rank third behind China and the United States among the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters. So that's how much we're talking about here. And one last thing, I also said I would uh, do one last thing. So the uh, the claim that methane from cows is perfectly a part of the carbon cycle. I've been talking about this a lot lately in some uh, social media communications of, of mine. You may have seen some diagrams that show that, you know, methane from cows is biogenic and it's perfectly a part of the carbon cycle. There's these nice diagrams that shows it just kind of circling around back into the ground like photosynthesis. But what those diagrams are not showing is that only about one to two percent of uh, of methane emitted from cows breaks back down into CO two and and will draw back down into the ground. Uh, the other amount, uh, as long as our our number of cattle continue to increase, which it has been, uh, continues to heat the the planet at about eighty times the strength over ten years. So methane is a big part of the story. And this uh, shifting gears a bit from climate change, one of the most basic but often forgotten reasons animal source foods are far worse on about every other environmental metric too is the inefficient feed conversion rate and how much food loss you essentially have when we try to convert feed into meat. Um, so as shown on the right, there's significant immediate loss, food loss, upwards of 97% for beef, uh, but even a loss of 88% of calories for chicken. So um, consider too that over 80% of all soy is fed to farmed animals. And in Canada too, there's actually some pretty significant numbers too. 80% of all barley, 60% of all corn, 30% of wheat grown in Canada, uh, taking up about 1,500 uh, or 15 million acres are fed to farmed animals who return, you know, only about that average of about 10% back in meat. So food waste, big issue i care deeply about it too the biggest cause of food waste right now that we have is this unnecessarily unnecessary industry of animal agriculture we're losing a huge amount of otherwise human edible food so biodiversity is likely as big of a crisis as climate change but gets a fraction of the attention it's been dem demonstrated and documented in the scientific literature that animal agriculture is the most significant driver of habitat loss on the planet and the biggest driver of global biodiversity loss as well. So today, only 4% of mammals are wild animals in terms of biomass. Uh, the rest are human and livestock. Humans and animals farmed are 30 times the living mass of all wild mammals and must compete with them for space and resources. And the recent uh, WWF Living Planet report concluded that food systems have caused 70% of biodiversity loss on land and 50% of biodiversity loss in water. So it's not just how many species we are losing. Species are going extinct at rates 100 to 1,000 times faster than the Earth's past. Uh, a few different studies here that looked at, uh, one of them looked at 400 vertebrate species that went extinct in the last century. Uh, it should have taken 800 to 10,000 years to kind of naturally disappear for whatever uh, reason. And uh, another study that looked at 20,000 species of terrestrial vertebrates uh, showed that 87.7% of them will lose habitat to agricultural expansion by 2050. And What's causing agricultural expansion? It's certainly not plant-based foods. What uses the most land is by far uh, ranching, but it's also the, the mass extension of feed crop land to uh, feed an ever-growing uh, amount of animals in confinement for meat. And so 
there's a couple of quick stories here that I uh, I think help describe the uh, the connections between biodiverse ecosystems and uh, carbon drawdown. So in areas where sea otters are hunted out of existence, the population of their favorite foods, sea urchins, dramatically increase. Those urchins then go on to eat vast forests of kelp. So this recently played out in BC. Uh, since protection measures for otters went into effect, to some extent, uh, the kelp forests have rebounded and now sequester, last I saw, about 10% of BC's carbon emissions. So ecosystems as well, without wolves or other wild predators, can have too many deer who eat too many saplings, which hinders trees' ability to grow and sequester more carbon. And probably the most um, interesting example that I, I like is um, whales store as much carbon as major areas of forest. And so how does this happen? So consider that rebuilding just the southern hemisphere blue whale population would sequester the equivalent to preserving 43,000 hectares of temperate forest, an area comparable to the size of the city of Los Angeles, and rebuilding all whale populations is equivalent to rewilding 110,000 hectares of forest or an area the size of Rocky Mountain National Park. So most of this presentation is related to the ecological crisis related to land-based animal agriculture, but uh, damage being done to our oceans is uh, a whole topic on its own. But consider that 66 to 87% of the marine environment is severely altered by human actions and 55% is covered by industrial fishing. That's from a recent report uh, from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, IPBES. So in terms of like the biodiversity in the ocean, uh, both bycatch and technological prowess has resulted in this collapse. The World Wildlife Fund concluded in their 2020 living report that uh, fishing in particular uh, for human consumption is considered to have the greatest impact on ocean biodiversity. And by the year 2100, without significant changes, more than half of the world's marine species may be close to extinction. Sharks currently are less than 10% of the original population. Most whales are less than 1% of original populations. So, and even if you look at like freshwater areas, uh, they're not immune to this either. Biomass in freshwater has declined by 84%. So often when this topic comes up, you think, well, what about sustainably caught fish? What about MSC and all these uh, blue tick certifications you see? So with that, just consider a few things. Uh, high impact fisheries represented 83% of MSC certified catches between 2009 and 2017. This included uh, lobster and crab fishing in the North Atlantic that has been a main driver of what looks like the imminent extinction of the North Atlantic right whale, where there's about less than 350 left. So that's just mind blowing. Um, illegal and unreported catches uh, is another consideration within all this. Uh, this represents 20 to 32% by weight of all wild caught seafood imported to the US in 2011. And um, it's estimated that about 26 million tons of fish per year are caught illegally for a $23 billion black market. So there's all kinds of issues with um, with fishing that is really just, very difficult to track, um, a very difficult uh, process there. And um, the last study that looked at this that I saw looked at 44 studies showed that nearly 40% of the fish studied for mislabeling around the world was not what was advertised. So yeah, there's whole different species sometimes that are, you know, different species are being named in terms of um, what people are buying, what they think they're getting. So big concern. So climate adaptation is key since we are currently on track for at least 2.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. And that's only if we, if the countries meet all the pledges and targets that they have made. Um, and as we know, they're, they're rarely met. So as perspective and a reminder at about two to three degrees Celsius, we'll see major societal disruption with uh, increased climate refugees, global water and food production crises, uh, and likely war and conflict over just limited resources that are left. The Canadian government just released their first of its kind national adaptation strategy. 
And for food systems, they boasted of an illustrative action case study, they call it, uh, where dairy farms now have a national quality assurance program to sign on to environmental farm plan, EFP. And which I looked through it. It's about as weak of a plan for dairy as, uh, as I've seen. And it's really just tinkering around to try to keep business as, as usual. Meanwhile, there's significant um, problems that will result from continuing dairy as usual. But looking at the bigger picture, what's the best way to adapt to reduce suffering and death? The World Health Organization estimated two of the greatest causes of climate-related deaths will be heat and undernutrition. But new research shows that there will be multiple more times climate-related deaths from unhealthy overconsumption, mostly related to animal sourced foods. And a majority uh, plant-based diet, uh, as shown here, is the best way to reduce climate-related deaths. Now, this study uh, cited on the bottom right there, uh, Willett and others in 2019, so the dietary changes from current diets to healthy diets are likely to substantially benefit human health, averting about 10.8 to 11.6 million deaths per year, reduction of 19 to 23%. So for context, just for how substantial that number is, the IPCC 22 adaptation report predicts that deaths due to climate change will be 9 million per year by 2100. So really, this implies that diet change is the single best thing we can do, USA and globally in Canada, to uh, adapt to climate change. Of course, there's many things we can do, but understanding this, communicating that, having that as part of national adaptation strategies is key. If it's not, you're missing a huge part of how you can reduce suffering, how you can address climate change and be better prepared for it. So um, yeah, often when I share that, some people are like, well, um, you know, how is diet change reducing the risk of, um, you know, technically climate related death? And this is mostly because diet change that reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease by shifts to whole food plant based diets, it significantly reduces the chances of death from increased exposure to pollution and heat stress. So ultimately, it increases our collective resilience to, to face some of these things that will become more and more normal. And uh, overall, in this entire climate adaptation space related to this, there's a major justice and racial component to this, since the effects of environmental damage will impact marginalized and racialized communities first due to location of these high polluting industries like factory farms, uh, but also industrial fossil fuel operations. And uh, considering that too, like it's also there's a there's a lack of access to healthy plant foods in poorer regions, uh, which is increases increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. So what's that competition with this strategy to shift to plant-based diets? Tripled meat consumption in just over a century, it's the systematic result of subsidies, lobbying, marketing, funded academics and governments bailing out conglomerates like Tyson, Cargill, and JBS. The top 10 meat and dairy companies and six largest trade associations in the U.S. alone has spent over $330 million just on lobbying related to the environment since 2000. And some of the biggest companies in the world are livestock companies, and they're given a complete pass on uh, on goals to reduce their environmental damage. And what goals they do put in place are mostly just related to energy of their facilities versus um, addressing the deforestation, the methane, really the, the components that make up the majority of food emissions. So the top five meat and dairy companies combined emit more greenhouse gases than Exxon, Mobile, Shell, or BP. And most of the top 35 global meat and dairy companies, uh, as, as was shown in the study on the top left there, uh, don't even report or underreport their emissions. So there's very little accountability and that needs to change. Uh, what this, these other kind of diagrams are describing on this slide is despite committing to be net zero by 2040, JBS, the world's largest meat company, increases annual greenhouse gases by 51% between 2016 and 2021. 
And that makes JBS now responsible for more greenhouse gases than all of Italy combined. So now people, there's some good news. I'm going to get some good good news here from about now on. So thanks for hanging in so far. Uh, there's there's some some good things to be optimistic about here too. So people typically increase meat consumption as countries get richer. Um, of course, we see that. But there's signs of this trend changing. Uh, new research, as shown on the bottom right there, shows that people, um, uh, certain countries are showing uh, signs of peak or at least plateauing uh, meat consumption uh, in rich countries. And Canada was one of those. So we're seeing uh, certainly a peak and starting to decrease in, in beef and pork. Um, but there's still a little bit of increase happening with chicken. So what proposed solutions exist? And how do they stack up in terms of scalability to feed the estimated 2050 population of 10 billion uh, without killing the planet? This is ultimately the question. In Canada, the, the largest agricultural related climate fund, <clears throat> which is 200 million from 2021 to 2024, uh, focuses on the wrong things. Uh, it focuses on incentivizing rotational grazing practices instead of agriculture food solutions like plant-based shifts. And, you know, I would say like addressing nitrogen management would be a good one and cover cropping would be good too. But uh, as I've been analyzing what's happening with this fund, it's being dominated by the grazing discussion. So let's look at that. What's going on with grazing? Regenerative agriculture is a term some of you may have heard. It uh, largely lacks an agreed upon definition, but corporate investments in it have uh, forms of cattle grazing, uh, integrate cover crops, use forms of conservation agriculture that are all generally great, like composting, polycropping. But does this make beef carbon neutral? This is ultimately the question. If we shift to more grass finished beef, Contrary to initial perceptions from many, we actually would be producing up to four times more methane than from feedlot cattle. And the reason why this happens is because grass-fed and finished cattle produce more methane because they live longer, albeit they're still very short lives, but there's at least six months longer of life. And they eat a more fibrous diet uh, than, uh, than in combinement in feedlots. But let's look closer at regenerative agriculture. So soil is a big part of this discussion, yet soil organic carbon is far, far higher in undisturbed and natural ecosystems. Agricultural lands store 25 to 75% less soil organic carbon on average. And especially with farmland soil, <clears throat> soil carbon sequestration is time limited and soils reach what's called like a carbon equilibrium within a span of about 20 to 30 years. And there is quite a bit of variance. Sometimes it's even a bit less than that. Sometimes it's even more. Where at that point, no more carbon can be taken in without corresponding loss. And even before reaching carbon equilibrium, soil carbon stored in topsoil is easily lost during drought, flooding, and other disturbances that are very common in farmland. So to me, truly regenerative agriculture considers aspects beyond just soil, but also what frees up land, what regenerates biodiversity beyond just a few more birds and insects, but increased native wild animals, and in turn, what, in turn, what increases carbon sequestration. It's marketing and disinformation agenda to dance around the reality that the number one cause of soil erosion and degradation is animal agriculture. And this is mostly from over overgrazing, but it's just, it's very... Uh, deceptive and disinformation to then say, well, if you just graze a little bit better, this could be the solution to soil. I don't buy it. And neither does the science. There's very little science that backs this up. Of course, there's lots of funding for science in this space, but you can see if you, if you compare the studies that were significantly funded from animal scientists that were looking at only solutions within that space, you can see just a huge disparity, disparity between the independent environmental analyses and climate scientists as they're looking at this topic. So a last point on this one here would be something called marginal land. Of course, when I mention this, people say, well, cattle graze on areas that are marginal. There's no other use of that land. So this is a myth that claims that, you know, grazing cattle is the best use of agro agricultural land that can't be cropped. Um, 
Firstly, even poor quality soils can support hardy plants like uh, leafy greens, hemp, fruit trees, buckwheat, rye, barley, quinoa. And secondly, it's a very human-centric belief that the only use of degraded land is domesticated grazing. Wild animals in these areas largely at odds with cattle farming, uh, along with other strategic rewilding, can do a far better job in repairing land. On the topic, I highly recommend watching the documentary Rewilding a Mountain from Dr. William Ripple, who's also uh, published extensively on the topic. And uh, they tracked cattle removal in the 90s in the American West. Uh, and this is applicability to many other areas of the world uh, with some different ecosystem situations. But this documentary is in line with lots of research on the topic. And uh, there is 109 independent studies um, uh, meta-analysis that looked at this topic too and it looked at the response of animals or plants to livestock grazing versus exclusion of cattle from the land and it showed that across all animals livestock exclusion increased abundance and, uh, and diversity so rewilding is a big part of this message now another common myth uh, i want to cover is this idea that buying local and organic is the best environmental decision to make with regards to food the data shows it's flawed and it's a distraction from shifts to plant base. Uh, so looking at transport of food on the graph on the left, that's the red. So try to find some red in that graph. You'll see that it's almost non-existent. Uh, with beef, it's less than 1% of its greenhouse gas footprint. So it's less about buying local as it is first shifting towards plant base, uh, you know, reducing deforestation, reducing methane. And then, of course, there is benefits to, to eating uh, local, but um, first shifting to plant-based would be key and seasonal foods as well. And then on the right, uh, as I see, we're getting a little tight for time. Uh, this is a topic that could be something on its own, but uh, the organic versus conventional agriculture is also quite the hot topic. But uh, you'll see the organic methods, especially as it relates to uh, uh, to meat and dairy, which you'll see that graph uh, describes, a lot of times it's worse. It might use a bit less energy, but it increases acidification, eutrophication, land use. So in many ways, it can be a lot worse. <clears throat> so while the vast majority of monocrops are inefficiently fed to, to livestock, it's also important to advocate for forms of regenerative plant farming. There's a number of excellent groups working on this, but I just wanted to quickly shout out to uh, Biocyclic Vegan Group. Uh, their certified farms have biocyclic soil that, that protects from erosion and dehydration. And more research is needed here, but uh, I'm a, I'm a co-author on a new research that's underway that's um, with uh, Jimmy Videlli on his veganic farm in Quebec. And there is, um, yeah, this veganic way of, of farming is an underappreciated topic within regenerative agriculture. So while eating a whole food plant-based diet is key for health, it's best for the environment, I think it's important to be aware of the cultural and psychological components when it comes to behavior change. And uh, plant-based precision fermentation, cultured meat can speed up this transi transition and would come with many environmental benefits. Uh, Singapore has cultured chicken being sold now. The FDA in the U.S. just gave the green light to Upside Foods to do the same. The energy footprint for cultivated meat is still quite high. That would be one area to consider, but the amount of land this would free up would be exponential. And if we don't decarbonize our energy system by the time this really scales up, then I think we'll be in deeper issues. So I think that's um, a good thing to watch in this space. Now, government action can be a key driver in creating systemic change. Many governments have revised their national food guides based on a large body of science on the topic. Uh, of course, in Canada here, they're saying choose protein foods that come from plants more often. In Sweden, they're saying eat less meat, choose more plant foods instead. Even in Brazil, saying choose diets based on a variety of foods of plant origin. And in the Netherlands, of course, uh, they're saying a shift in the direction of more plant-based diets and less animal-based dietary pattern improves health and has a lower ecological burden. So behavioral nudges, this is currently taking shape in uh, New York City in terms of uh, increasing access and making the default option 
a plant-based option. The um, uh, yeah, Mayor Eric Adams launched and established plant-based meals as the default option for public schools and patients in New York City public hospitals. And they're also doing a number of Meatless Monday initiatives and Plant Powered Fridays, as they call it, at public schools and serving plant-based at all city events. This is the way to go. And this is in line with a lot of great research on the topic by Dr. Emma Garnett and others. And I also would recommend checking out Greener by Default. They have a good breakdown of research on this topic in particular. And this is actually news from a couple of days ago. Uh, the popular European grocery chain, uh, Lidl, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, their chief buyer, Christoph Graf, announced major product changes explicitly around the need to eat less meat if we're going to be able to feed 10 billion people in the future. And he went on to say, we must live within the, pl- the boundaries of the planet and that this can only be achieved with fewer animal products. So these are champions and they're out there and we need to support this. And this is real good news. They have 12,000 stores in 31 countries. So um, other grocery chains should, should jump on board there. And then just a few comments on kind of the scientific consensus on the topic. There's, you know, a lot of marketing and propaganda around, you know, the uncertainty of this topic. Uh, People are confused about what to eat. Uh, The environmental topic in particular, there's lots of disinformation, of course, nutrition space too. But uh, looking at what the kind of experts are saying on this space, without major changes to our food system, uh, it'll continue to push Earth well beyond its planetary boundaries. And in the report, Diets for a Better Future, uh, authors uh, Brett Loken and others show that the global food production is the single largest human pressure on Earth, threatening local ecosystems, driving a sixth mass extinction of species, and impacting the stability of the entire Earth system. So it's a very important to understand that the science is clear. And organizations as well are jumping on board this you know, consensus and now openly speaking about it, which they should. And the latest IPCC report showed that um, the greatest shift potential would come from switching to plant-based diets. And they showed with high confidence, which is their way of saying like, this is the scientific consensus, that diets high in plant protein and low in meat and dairy are associated with lower greenhouse gases and ruminant ruminant meat shows the highest greenhouse intensity. Of course, we know this, but this is the scientific consensus that's being communicated now. So don't be fooled by the other way around. And then just the last few couple comments, uh, just my uh, unsolicited uh, tips. Uh, I would say advocating non-judgmentally, but boldly uh, for transformational environmental health and ethical changes we need would be key. Acting as as an example, urge evidence-based solutions uh, oriented and system changes to government and businesses from that kind of evidence-based lens. And demand transparency. Food companies are not tracking their supply chains well. Countries like um, countries in Europe and even the EU said that they want, uh, they're not importing any more deforestation related products. Well, there's a whole lot more transparency needed in the food system to know if something even comes from deforestation. So, um, yeah, and last I'll say is just, you know, the perfection is the enemy of good. So, a major shift to plant rich diets, especially in a society that normalizes the alternative, I think that's all significant progress. And I'll leave it there. Feel free to contact me anytime on email there. Or in, and uh, you can find me mostly on Twitter and Instagram if you want to connect as well. Thanks so much, Nicholas. That was very informative. Um, just a couple uh, questions from our viewers and myself, if you if, if you don't mind. Um, sure. First question is uh, somebody asked about the references and uh, some of the, the text on your slides was a little bit small. Did you say those slides are available online for those who want to dig into them? Yeah, and let me even pull it up right now. So it's on the recording. So you can even, uh, I have the slides at the end. You know so, what, yeah. we'll, we'll get the link to it from you and we'll make sure, sure to post that uh, along with the video so that people can find that very easily. Great. Um, you mentioned uh, one of the recent COP meetings. So there was COP27 uh, biodiversity, uh, or no, COP27 was climate change, mm-hmm. COP15 biodiversity conference. Uh, we've certainly written about both of those on our blog. Did you have any impressions on uh, what came out of those meetings that you want to share? 
I mean, I, I like the media attention that comes out of those meetings. Um, it's, I think there's some progress happening, but it's not fast enough there. I think the most progress that comes from that is, you know, the world kind of looks at the environment a bit more. Uh, but in terms of like the actual agreements that are coming out of it, you look at COP15, the biodiversity summit. It's great that there's a new initiative to protect 30% of land by 2030, but all the previous targets for biodiversity were not met, met at all, not even close. So what makes us think these ones will? And then it's also worrisome when you look at like the actual document uh, of the COP15, like the final draft, they had things in there like um, uh, allowing sustainable hunting and um, uh, sustainable uh, farming should be key. And this is very vague language. And it doesn't sound like the transformational change that we need. So I think they should call out the main drivers of biodiversity loss. They didn't do that. They didn't call it animal agriculture. They didn't call it logging. Uh, you know, there's other drivers, of course, besides uh, farming animals, but um, you got to call it out. And uh, only when we can kind of have this conversation, can we kind of move on and get there, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. And given that animal agriculture is such a, a big contributor, uh, it's interesting how, you know, we, we've known this for a long time. Uh, and yet uh, everybody understands the problems with fossil fuels. Uh, and for many people, when you talk about animal agriculture, it's like they've never heard any of this before. Do you have any sense of why that is? Food is more personal. Food is, uh, I, th I think there's more cultural family ties to it. So there's an extra kind of psychological component. It also is like an easier thing to greenwash, I find. Like if you think of, a lot of people think of the the happy local farm, uh, vast pastures and lush lands. Um, you know, I think the last few years, it, there's been some better kind of communication showing how food actually gets to our plate. I think there's many prominent environmental scientists, climate scientists that are now speaking out a lot more in the last five years re with regards to food. And then you see the the progress from, you know, municipalities and countries and, um, you know, at the local grassroots level. I think we're at a stage where like, you know, we're, we're getting there to a lot um, more kind of policy perspectives and innovation in the food space with plant-based alternatives. I think that has the potential to kind of exponentially shift, uh, make the change quicker, but um, it's still going to be tricky. Cause it's still, there's still that personal component to food. And if we can kind of make the swap as easy as possible, making abundant options available, uh, making it the default in many cases, people are not upset by that. They get to try new food that's delicious. Sometimes it tastes and looks very similar to what they're eating before. So I think all those things are all relatively new and I think they're going to make a big difference. And uh, are you aware of any countries currently that are taking the lead in policy making on this issue? I wouldn't say necessarily countries, but like something like the C40 cities movement, um, cities like uh, New York City, I think with the, the slide I showed there in terms of shifting the default, doing kind of bold uh, policies that are good for health, good for the environment. I think we're seeing a lot more examples like that pop up there's no particular country that comes to mind. Like I, I was very optimistic about the Canadian food guide, of course, but it hasn't really been operationalized. We haven't really seen that in terms of in the schools here and in, in hospitals. So any sort of new policy or kind of framework or guidance really needs to match what's actually happening. Um, when you go to schools, when you go to businesses and, um, there's examples of that happening, but yeah, not quick enough. Uh, are you able to speak to the um, impact of commercial fishing on climate change? You might have touched on it briefly, uh, but it's something that uh, I hear pretty often as well. You know, people will say, oh, I'm, I'm moving away from meat because that's no good, uh, but fish, fish is okay. Uh, what do you say to that? I mean, it is lower in terms of greenhouse gas intensity. Um, that's clear. But, uh, you know, I think the reason why people have kind of thought that fish is more eco-friendly is because of the narrow ecological lens we have in the overall space. Like we just think of just carbon dioxide, mostly just from fossil fuels, but really just greenhouse gases as a whole is really what people get to. But then when you look at uh, biodiversity loss, you look at uh, dead zones in the ocean, um, and then you look at the 
inconsistencies with actually even knowing what you're actually getting when you choose fish. Then you can see that this isn't a good option either for some different reasons. Uh, if you're looking just at greenhouse gases, the first thing to, to, I think, get rid of your diet would be beef and dairy. Um, cause that would also cover the land use consideration too. And a lot of the biodiversity issues, but, um, you know, scaled up chicken, a lot of people are shifting to chicken scaled up chicken has had a, a major impact as well on biodiversity, not like per unit, but in terms of like the scale of these farms, like they're huge. So there's tens of thousands of, uh, you know, birds in a, in a barn that uh, you all get a feed and, uh, they get to, you know, the slaughter weight quicker, but there's still a whole lot of land that, that, um, you know, you need to, to use to grow feed for them. And, you know, something with chicken just to kind of veer a bit away, like there's also the other zoonotic disease risk and antibiotic resistant bacteria risk, which is not really related to the environment necessarily, but, um, you know, these are other wicked problems that, um, we should just reduce our risk. Like why, why play with the chances of having more pandemics? It wouldn't be fun, you know? For sure. Um, another question. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how we can help the Canadian government realize the urgency of this problem and yeah. help uh, help uh, make the transition to plant-based, at least in, in Canada? Yeah, so the Canadian Food Guide is uh, something we have that is solidified in place. I think advocating for that at the local uh, political level, as well as um, federally saying, okay, you need to match your um, your government events, your um, you know city events for municipalities and uh, hospital schools all need to start uh, matching what what those guidelines show. Um, you know joining movements, I think is important. Uh, movements of people that uh, demand change ultimately are what put pressure on government as well. Uh, you saw this countless times throughout history. Uh, I do some work with uh, plant-based treaty now as well, and uh, they do some good work in terms of um, a number of areas in terms of mobilizing movements to demand change based on evidence and science. And um, one of the most encouraging things we're seeing is uh, the the cities are taking uh, steps that the federal government is not, and they're showing based on, you know, more localized situation that, you um, you know, this can be a, a major win for the environmental footprint of the region and, and the health of citizens. And, you know, having those as examples to then bring to other levels of government, I think will do um, a lot of good. Yeah, and I'll just make a plug there for the plant-based cities movement, uh, which is a relatively new organization. I'm not sure if you're familiar yes. with that one. Amazing, yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more. Um, can you speak to uh, what, what can we expect from technological advances? So, for example, one thing people talk about in terms of cows is, uh, you know, feeding them seaweed, perhaps uh, okay. re reducing emissions that way. Is, can we reasonably expect to get much out of that? I think the, that'll continue to take up media space. I think that will continue to take up attention. Uh, you have major organizations like the FAO that are only looking at solutions within animal agriculture. So you can quickly pick these apart, though. If you look at seaweed, uh, there's a number of very quick issues. Uh, one, you there's no real solution to feeding them seaweed when they're out on pasture. It's more in the feedlot situation. And they're not on feedlot their entire lives. Even ones in confinement, they typically are out on pasture for a big part of their life too. So uh, say you're looking at just within feedlot, cows don't like the taste of it. So they need to fit it within certain supplements. Uh, the, the reason why seaweed technically does reduce methane a little bit is the chemical reaction that creates bromoform. Bromoform is a ozone depleting substance. Um, it also is a, a cancerous uh, situation, which might not transpire in terms of the cow because they live such young lives, but there's also all kinds of concerns with that. Um, you know, there's other things as well. Like there's, there's putting mask on cows I've seen there's um, you know, feed swaps to reduce emissions. And I think what we know from the data is even the best raised type of beef you'll say you could say uh still is more emitting more land intensive than the worst plant food so say 
soy tofu, which is a great plant food, but it's considered a bit higher in terms of footprint. So uh, even with these small little techno fixes within animal agriculture, it's not going to get to where we need to get to. So put all that time and energy towards actual solutions is what I say. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, thank you again for all the very, very helpful information. Uh, thank you uh, to our viewers uh, for joining us for this speaker series. And we'll see you again next time. Thanks so much.